Hello and welcome to this week's patrons only podcast, or you can also see the video uh, if you want to. Um, this week I want to focus in on Gamaliel in Acts chapter 5. I love Gamaliel. Uh, not only is this a very rich intersection of the book of Acts with Jewish history, uh, but uh, Gamaliel gives some great philosophy here. Um, sounds very stoic in some respects, but um, I'm not in any way wanting to suggest that uh, uh, Luke depicts Gamaliel like a Stoic. Uh, this fits, actually, with what we might expect Gamaliel to say. Uh, but let's, let's dig right in. So who is this, this Gamaliel that's mentioned twice uh, in the book of Acts? Well, he's a Pharisee. Um, Luke tells us he's a Pharisee. And, of course, we also know he's a Pharisee, uh, both from um, Josephus, the Jewish historian, uh, but also from later Jewish rabbinic literature. This guy's famous. Uh, this is uh, Gamaliel the Elder. He will have a grandson uh, who will also play into Jewish history. Uh, he's a teacher of the law, um, as Pharisees were. Isn't that, isn't that what a Pharisee primarily did? Pharisees were lay people, really. They weren't, um, they weren't priests, uh, but Pharisees um, were experts on the law, uh, they, they kept the law to a high standard. Now, uh, the Essenes uh, seem to have kept the law a little bit more strictly uh, than the Pharisees. The Pharisees were very strict uh, with their law keeping. Um, you, you may have heard that song that they teach sometimes in Sunday school. I don't want to be a Pharisee because they're not fair, you see. Um, actually, that song's not, not exactly fair to the Pharisees uh, because the Pharisees were uh, the Pharisees were just trying to keep the law. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, there were no doubt many hypocrites who were Pharisees. Um, and, but I don't, think, I don't think that being strict in your life or being strict in what you think God expects of you necessarily means that you're legalistic. The word legalistic to me um, implies that you like rules for their own sake and that you'll put rules above people. And, and whenever you have rule-oriented people, and there's a certain human personality that, that is, that is rule-oriented, it loves rules, it needs to make rules, it needs to know what the rules are. There's a certain human personality uh, that's like that. Um, and uh, no doubt that type of personality gravitated uh, to the Pharisees. And, and so whenever you have that kind of a person, you're going, I mean, if, if a legalist is going to join a club, well, let's see, what, I'm in college now. What, what club should I join? You know, the Pharisees are definitely going to join the let's make up some rules club. Um, and so if you're a legalist, you're going to be a Pharisee. But that doesn't necessarily mean that all Pharisees were legalists. Um, and and uh, some Pharisees probably, I, I believe, were just trying to keep the law. They wanted to serve God. They were voted most likely to be righteous in high school because they were actually trying to keep the law. Um, and uh, as I think, uh, I don't think it's my next slide, um, but um, uh, uh, Luke Acts has the most positive view of the Pharisees of any of the Gospels. Mark, Mark doesn't have much to say about the Pharisees, and Mark's, Mark's not as hard as Matthew and John. Matthew and John are really hard on the Pharisees. And probably Matthew and John were written at a time when Pharisees were in the ascendancy. That is to say, Matthew and John were written after the temple was destroyed, when the Pharisees were becoming uh, the point of contact with the Romans. So at the time of the, the earliest church, the Sadducees were the point of, of contact. I don't want to be a Sadducee because they're Sadducee. Um, why are they sad? Because they don't believe in resurrection. We've talked about Sadducees in an earlier uh, podcast. Uh, Sad Sadducee probably coming from Zadok. These were probably, uh, at, at one point of Israel's history, disaffected priests, because the, if you remember, uh, the, the Maccabees uh, took over the priesthood after the, uh, the Maccabean conflict. Um, the Maccabees in the 160s took over the priesthood. And so you had these sons of Zadok, Zedekies, you know, Sad Sad Sadducees, you had these sons of Zadok who were disaffected for many decades uh, until uh, they kind of slipped back into the stream of priesthood. So that's probably where the Sadducees come from, or at least that's my novel. Um, Pharisees, on the other hand, were uh, uh, lay people 
who believed very strongly in the law. Um, they, they were part of diners clubs. There were others that joined these diners clubs, but there were these habarim, these diners clubs that met uh, and ate at a high standard of purity. And then, like I said, there were also these scenes who were more, who more kind of um, separated themselves uh, even further and were even, even more strict in their keeping of the law. Well, there's a little bit of the lay of the land with regard to groups. So uh, Gamaliel was a famous Pharisee. These were scholars too. A lot of Pharisees were scholars. Uh, these were the ones voted most likely to know what this passage meant, or at least they could tell you all the different interpretations that people had come up uh, with uh, on. So these are the college professor types. Uh, okay. Um, Gamaliel is said in um, Acts 22.3, uh, Paul says that he studied at the feet of Gamaliel. What does this mean? Well, um, of course, our first instinct is to, is to take it to mean that um, Gamaliel was Paul's um, mentor and that Paul uh, was basically a uh, apprentice, you know, learning, learning the trade of the Pharisee with uh, Gamaliel. And of course, that, that could be what happened. Um, the, the curious thing is, though, is that Gamaliel was from the school of Hillel. Uh, in fact, later Jewish tradition considered him to be a relative, maybe a grandson of the great Hillel. There were two schools of Pharisees, two schools of Pharisees that were formed in the first century BC, the school of Hillel and the school of Shammai. Uh, and uh, of these two schools, uh, Gamaliel clearly, from what he says in Acts 5, fits into the school uh, of Hillel. And the school of Hillel uh, was more tolerant. It was more lenient. You know, if, if we were in our current climate today, they would call these uh, snowflake liberals, you know, the, the Hillel, Hillites. Uh, of course, from a Christian perspective, they were the ones who were probably more likely to love their neighbor as themselves. It's a funny, funny thing, really. Um, but um, the school of Hillel was more, more tolerant. They were more lenient. And we see this in, in Gamaliel. Uh, uh, Gamaliel is one of these Pharisees that Luke Acts, Luke Acts is much more nuanced, as Craig Keener says in his Acts commentary. Um, uh, Luke Acts is much more nuanced in how it uh, treats the Pharisees, uh, as I'll say, I think, in a second more. Now, the school of Hillel was more, uh, I, I put fatalistic here, um, uh, but what, we're, what, what I mean is, is that the school of Hillel basically uh, their philosophy was let God take care of it. This is why I said Gamaliel reminds me of a Stoic. The Stoics basically said, you know, uh, love your fate. The, the mind that rules the universe has a, has a, a purpose and a plan. Submit to it. Uh, don't, uh, don't try to take matters into your own hands. God will take care of it. And so the school of Hillel was more uh, 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 sit back and let God take care of it. Um, and so the school of Hillel may very well have believed that God was going to send a Messiah. The school of Hillel may very well have, meant, have believed that God was going to restore Israel. But the school of Hillel did not believe in doing anything about it. So when God, when it's God's, you know, Kesara Sara, when God wants to restore Israel, God will restore Israel. In the meantime, let's just pray and, and go on. So, and we find this in this passage and where Gamaliel basically says, look, if these men are of God, you can't stop them. Uh, if they aren't of God, God will stop them. So we don't need to do anything here, people. <laughs> That's a very Gamaliel, Hillelite kind of thing to say. Now, of course, uh, in this particular case, that was the right answer. Um, and uh, there are Gamaliel days. Uh, of course, there are other times when God wants us to do something. Um, there are Joshua days. And so we shouldn't assume uh, that, that Gamaliel is speaking for all times and all circumstances. There are times to let God take care of it, uh, but then there are times to, to take arms against a sea of trouble. Um, there are times to do something uh, about it. So Gamaliel is giving us one of the Proverbs, as it were, about what to do uh, when, when, when things are happening. Okay, the, the other school was more activist, the school of Shammai. Uh, the school of Shammai was more militant. Um, uh, some have said, I think N.T. Wright and uh, Craig Keener in his commentary, have suggested that the school of Shammai was, was more prominent in, in the days before the Jewish war, before Jerusalem was destroyed. So at this time, at this point of history, uh, they, they suggest the school of Shammai would have been more 
uh, in the ascendancy. And the school of Shammai was more, if it is to be, it is up to me. You know, uh, don't rely on someone else. Dun, 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 dun. You know, there's, let's act. You know, let's go do something. And so the, the school of Shammai was a little bit more militant, it seems to me, uh, than the school of Hillel. Well, you can see where I, I when I read that uh, Paul studied at the feet of Gamaliel, um, Paul does not, the, the pre-Christian Saul does not have the flavor of a Hillelite. The pre-Christian Paul has, this, has the flavor of a Shammaite. Um, and so, you know, I kind of, the way I think of it is, well, he may have taken a class with, with Gamaliel, but that, he didn't major in Gamaliel. Um, of course, we don't know these things. But uh, Paul sir, sure seems a whole lot more like a Shammaite uh, than a Hillelite. Well, uh, as I was saying, Luke has the most favorable, the most nuanced presentation of the Pharisees. If you read Acts 15.5 in the Greek, it, he, he doesn't say, uh, I, I think there's some version that said, then some, um, some believers who used to be in the, in the sect of the Pharisees. I think one version says that. That's not what the Greek says, uh, as, as we'll see when we get there. It, it's a present tense. Then some Greek, well, I don't know if it's a present tense, but it's then some Greeks who were, who were part of the, of the sect of the Pharisees. I think that Acts 15.5 is saying that there were Pharisees who were Christians, that they saw no contradiction between being a Pharisee and being a believer. Um, and, and so uh, Luke is the only gospel that, that really, I mean, Matthew 23, really hard on the Pharisees. Um, so it would seem that there were Pharisees who believed in Christ and were part of the early Christian uh, movement. And of course, in Acts 23, Paul sides with the Pharisees when he's in the Sanhedrin. He says, I'm only in trouble here because I believe in resurrection. Uh, and then um, the Sadducees say, Phew. There's no resurrection. And the Pharisee says, wait a minute. Yes, there is. Maybe he's seen a vision of someone. And then they go at each other, you know, kind of rah, 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 rah. Uh, brilliant, brilliant stuff. Um, but so Luke Acts has the most favorable uh, presentation uh, of the Pharisees. And we, I think we do. I mean, I, I come from a very kind of strict holiness background, <clears throat> you know, where the women don't cut their hair and, and don't wear uh, slacks and, and no jewelry, no makeup. Uh, you know, no, uh, no facial hair. You know, I come from that, that kind of a background. I, I, I would not want to say that all of my relatives who uh, follow those patterns are legalists. I wouldn't want to say that. I'm sure some of them have, were, you know, um, but um, some of them are just trying to do what the Lord requires of them. And I'm sure that's true of some Pharisees too. Some Pharisees were just doing what they believed the Lord wanted them uh, to do. Uh, okay. Jewish revolutionaries. Interesting. Um, Gamaliel mentions two, um, two revolutionaries. He mentions a guy named Thutis, and he mentions a guy named Judas the Galilean. And basically, Gamaliel's point is, look, we got revolutionaries all the time. The Romans take care of them. Um, you know, this is the thing about pacifists. Uh, and if you're a pacifist, I don't want to offend you. Um, uh, but uh, it sure seems like I consider pacifism honorable and noble, but I'm glad not everybody is one. <laughs> um, but uh, so Thutis and, and Judas both represent revolutionary movements that failed. And Gamaliel says, look, uh, Thutis arose. He got about 400 people with him. Uh, mom, mom. Uh, Judas the Galilean arose, got a bunch of people about him, around him. Mom, mom. You know, so if these guys, and by the way, you can see where they're thinking. They're thinking that these Christians, these Jesus followers, are going to be revolutionaries. They're talking resurrection, up, upheaval of the world, you know. Um, and so um, you can see that's the way they're thinking about them. And, and basically, um, uh, Gamaliel says, you know, God will take care of them. If they're not, if they're not the real deal, God will squash them. Um, and if they are the real deal, we sure can't squash them. Um, I love that. Uh, although, again, that's not, it's not for every situation. Now, there is a little bit of a situation historically uh, with uh, Thutis, um, because according to Josephus, um, it was during the, the uh, procuratorship of Cuspius Fatus that Thutis thrived, uh, which would put him around the year 44. Now, when in the, in the story world of Acts, what date are we? Well, we're probably still in the year 3031 in Acts. 
So this hasn't happened yet, um, according to Josephus. Um, and so there's, there's been a flurry of discussion by scholars. Could there have been another 30th Thutis? Could Josephus be wrong? Um, and uh, the majority of scholars would say, look, um, history writing uh, did not uh, have the same expectations of history writing today. That uh, Luke would have felt um, Luke would have felt the artistic license to mention Thutis, even though Thutis hasn't happened yet in this speech, because Thutis is an example of exactly what Gamaliel is saying. Uh, and so some of this go comes back to some 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 of your basic understanding what the parameters of history writing were uh, for for Luke Acts. Um, so uh, I don't think Luke was lying. Again, we have our standards and we just assume, well, those must have been the standards for all time. But I think, according to history writing standards, Luke would have felt uh, it, it completely appropriate to mention Thutis here, even though uh, he, he knew it didn't happen yet, um, because it's, it, it illustrates what Gamaliel is saying. Now, there are, other, there are plenty of other hypotheses, you know, that there was a second Thutis, uh, or again, that Josephus is just wrong. Although Josephus is uh, more of a specialist when it comes, I mean, what is he writing on? Josephus was writing about these sorts of things. This would have happened during his childhood um, in jo Judea where he was growing up. Um, well, I'll leave that up to you and, and what you think the, the parameters are for these things. Judas the Galilean uh, seems to have um, uh, led a revolutionary around, around the year AD 6, um, which is where uh, there, there was a census in AD 6 that we know about, uh, according to Josephus. Again, unless Josephus got it wrong. Well, I'll leave it there. And uh, this has been this week's podcast uh, for patrons. Thank you for your patronage. Uh, and I appreciate your engagement with the material I'm creating. Thank you very much.